a man retrieves the burned remains of someone who may be his brother. But how can he really be sure? Under the rubble of a burned down house, investigators find the shattered remnants of a body. Can they piece together what happened? A scientist must identify a woman from scraps of burned bones weighing less than three paper clips. Will he be up to the challenge? The fate of a murder investigation hangs in the balance. For centuries, killers have relied on fire to conceal their crimes. But today, science is catching up with them. The consuming flames are powerless to destroy the burning evidence. Fire. Medieval alchemists saw it as a tool of transformation. Used correctly, it could turn dull lead into gleaming gold. Fire does transform, but not in the way the alchemists hoped. It is a process called oxidation, the speedy marriage of convenience between oxygen and another substance. The union creates new compounds, like carbon and water, while releasing enormous amounts of energy in the form of heat and light. All fires need an initiator, a spark to get them going. It's a little boost of energy that sets off the chain reaction. Then the fire burns until there's nothing left to burn. In Ohio, in 1994, Danny King started a fire, initiating a chain of events that transformed his entire world. King had a fiery relationship with his live-in girlfriend, Marilyn Garland. They had been together on and off for years and had a three-year-old child. But one March night, things spun horribly out of control. Danny King shot and killed Marilyn Garland. Then he tried to hide every trace of his crime. He set the body afire and kept it burning in a metal drum for two days. Occasionally, he'd stir the brittle bones with a stick, burning them until they would burn no more. He took what was left and smashed it into little pieces with a hammer. He gathered the remains and dumped them in the river. He may have thought that without a body, there could be no proof of murder. Then he ditched the drum behind a warehouse in town, a place where similar drums stood. Certain he had gotten away with his crime, Danny King waited six days before he called the police to report Garland as a missing person. Lieutenant Ray Todd worked on the case. Danny King reported Marilyn missing on the 26th, okay, and said that she'd been gone for a week. Well, it wasn't unusual for Marilyn to just take off for a, a few days at a time and go party. In his office, Lieutenant Todd reviewed King's missing persons report. Despite Garland's reputation, he had to take it seriously. He was joined on the case by Detective Gregory Mako. Mako found that Garland's family was taking the disappearance very seriously. We talked to other family members, getting conflicting stories, some saying There's, this is not her. This was her years ago when she was wild and free, but now she had a little boy. She wouldn't do this. She wouldn't leave the little boy behind. Something's wrong. They didn't believe that she just up and packed up and left. They actually believed that something had happened to her. 
Detective Mako began investigating more thoroughly. It was standard procedure to interview the person who filed the report. So they called in Danny King for questioning. He's a boyfriend, he's gonna be a suspect. And our thinking was, let's eliminate him immediately. That wasn't how it worked out. The interview took an unexpected turn. After that interview process, we asked him if he would be willing to take a, uh, a polygraph, a lie detector test. And he kind of hedged on it at first. So it just threw red flags. They arranged the test for the next day and dismissed King. King should have gone home, but he didn't. He went to a bar, concerned about the polygraph, and began drinking. He met a drinking buddy there and confided that he was worried about the test. The more he drank, the more he talked. Soon he confessed to killing Garland. His friend could tell King was serious. He felt he had no choice but to go to the police. He proceeded to tell me that he just left the bar where uh, him and Danny King were drinking for a couple of hours and that Danny King had confessed to him. Now the police had three facts to go on. A missing woman, a second-hand barroom confession, and a suspect who was nervous about a polygraph test. In terms of evidence, it was shaky at best. But Detective Mako and Lieutenant Todd felt it was enough to arrest King on suspicion of murder. King lived with a small child and a large dog, so the police felt uneasy about arresting him at his house. They decided to wait it out and apprehend him the next morning. They had no idea how violent he might be, but if he did commit this crime, they knew they were dealing with a dangerous man. Police called in the SWAT team for backup. As King went off to work, they forced his truck into a roadblock and made their move. Put your hands up! Put them up! Get out of there! You're under arrest, right? Get your hands up again. After King was safely in custody, the police began to build their case. For that, they needed more evidence. They obtained a search warrant and inspected King's house, but they found nothing incriminating. They had divers search the river and the canal for remains. They came up dry. Without a body, a weapon, or any other evidence against him, Lieutenant Todd didn't have a case, and Danny King would go free. If King truly did try to destroy the evidence in a metal drum, they reasoned, the drum must be around somewhere. But all they had was a burned patch of grass. The police placed an ad in the paper to find the drum. Soon after the ad ran, police received a call from a local businessman. One of his employees noticed a suspicious-looking barrel behind their warehouse. Lieutenant Todd went out to inspect it. You could see some uh, debris inside the bottom. Reached in and uh, picked up what I believed to be was a bone fragment. When I saw that, I just knew that this was the barrel that was used to burn the body of Marilyn Garland. Todd shook the drum to remove more debris clinging to its interior. Out came nails, scraps of wire, some fabric, and a seed pod. There's one seed in this vial here, and this was found in the barrel, okay? We didn't know uh, where it may have come from. Later, we had it identified as a catalpa seed. It's kind of an unusual tree, and there's not that many in the area. And uh, there is a catalpa tree at 125 Canal Street, which is where the uh, murder took place and where Danny burned Marilyn's body in the barrel. But potentially, the most damning evidence pulled from the drum was also the smallest, tiny shards of bone. If Todd could prove they were the victims, he'd have a case. He sent them to the coroner for analysis. 
The coroner was fairly sure the bones were human. However, he wanted them looked at by uh, a, a top forensic anthropologist. Okay, Rebecca, he contacted Doug stage. Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Owsley has built an international okay. reputation okay. by identifying human okay. remains. This wasn't the first time Owsley had worked with the Summit County Coroner's Office. A few years earlier, he helped them analyze the remains of Jeffrey Dahmer's first victim. We've had cases where they involve dismemberment, where they will dismember parts of the body and they'll put them in different locations. We've had cases where they've used acids and corrosives and disfigurement of the body to try and make it difficult to say who that person is. They all tell you something about the individual behind that process, and in the same sense, they all leave different kinds of evidence. In the case of Marilyn Garland, Owsley was literally scraping the bottom of the barrel. The evidence he had to work with consisted of 2.9 grams of bone fragments, about the weight of three paper clips. He also had three tiny shards of tooth enamel. All had been on fire for two days and were shrunken and distorted by the process. Could Owsley make sense of the paltry slivers? So it looks like. Too, Forensic sure. scientist Doug Owsley faced many okay, challenges in his work on the Marilyn Garland murder. The first was confirming whether the bone fragments from the metal drum were human. In this instance, we got really lucky because one of the fragments that was preserved was his finger bone. And if you think about it, different animals out there have very distinctive foot mm -hmm. and hand bone structure. Think of a, a hoof, for instance, or, or what the, the foot of a dog looks like. It's very different than what we see in the human. And we've got not a complete bone, but actually just half of it, but it's enough of, us, uh, it's enough of the bone for us to actually be able to look at that and say, well, that's human morphology. Here, for instance, Owsley's next task was more daunting. Could he tell if these were the remains of Marilyn Garland? With burning, it takes maybe more time to analyze it, and you really have to know exactly what you're looking for. But you still, with the fragments of the bone, male skeletons tend to be bigger, females tend to, on average, to be smaller. And so how it is burned and the size that is the result of that process is still going to tell you often something about sex, will still tell you something about age. And so it may make the identification much more difficult, more time consuming, maybe more tedious, but there's going to be a lot of evidence there. At the outset of the identification process, Owsley knew nothing about the victim's physical features. That's the way he prefers to work on a case. The ideal circumstance often is not to know a great deal about it. It's better to be a little bit in the dark on that sort of thing, or a lot in the dark about that. Let the bones talk to you in terms of what they have to say, say what the evidence is from those. From the remains, Owsley identified two rib fragments. The largest was a half inch long. He could tell one came from near the breastbone, perhaps the fourth or fifth rib. It provided the key to unlocking secrets about the body it came from. As we age, the rounded ends of our bones become more cup-shaped. The rib's cupped end suggested the person was between 24 and 40 years old. It was 3.4 millimeters thick by 13 millimeters wide. Owsley considered that small, even after assuming it shrunk up to 25% in the fire. You can never, on a piece of bone that size, bet everything. But on the other hand, you can turn around and say, in terms of probability, in terms of comparative data that we have, it's likely that this is a very small person. The size suggested the victim was either a female or a small male. If to determine at, which, instance, he compared the bone's size, height and thickness against a standard chart of rib measurements. Of rib In females, the fifth rib is going to have a, an average width of 4.65 millimeters. Males, fifth rib is going to be 6.78, so it's, it's much larger in terms of its thickness. So you work it through as best you can and try and characterize for the entire rib cage male and female values and what the difference is. With this bone, the answer was clear. By all standards, the person it came from was petite, very likely a female. The bones had told him all they could. 
it was time to take a look at the tooth fragments. This is, this is part of Owsley had only three to work with. They were little more than chips of enamel. By examining the thickness of the enamel, Owsley could tell they were from adult teeth. Their shape suggested their approximate position in the victim's mouth. They had telltale grooves that suggested dental work. But it wasn't enough. He needed some high-tech help to expose traces of fillings. Then he could match them to Garland's dental records. Owsley sent the teeth to the Smithsonian's Conservation Analytical Laboratory. There, they underwent a process called Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy, or EDS. Most dental fillings are a combination of silver, tin, mercury, and copper. They melt in the heat of a fire, leaving behind invisible traces. The EDS brings them out. The tooth fragment is put into the chamber. Then the air is drawn out, creating a vacuum. An electron beam bombards the sample. It can be aimed very precisely. The EDS provides a 3D image, so the operator knows where to point the beam. The stream of energy excites electrons in the sample, causing some of them to fly off. Some elements give off more electrons, some produce fewer. By measuring the electrons spewing from the sample, the EDS determines what elements it's made from. The results come out as a graph of peaks and valleys. Each peak represents a different element. Its height corresponds to the amount of the element in the sample. The graph was printed out and given to Owsley to analyze. This is an area here on this count, fragment one, where we're scanning on the tooth surface. You can pick up the peak for calcium, peak for phosphorus. And those are normal tooth enamel. On that same fragment, if you go to a different location, here now we're starting to get a peak for tin, indicating the presence of tin on, the, on that tooth surface. The EDS showed that two of the fragments had traces of copper, and all three had traces of tin. Because the metals were found only on specific parts of the teeth, Owsley concluded that they were the remains of fillings, not contamination from the metal drum. He had already determined from their shape that he had fragments of premolars. Now he knew they all had fillings. With this information, he was ready to compare his findings against Marilyn Garland's dental records. So working with a dentist, I sat down, we went through and figured out which teeth she'd lost in life, which teeth had fillings, what types of fillings they were, and we would prepare a dental chart. And this is a basis for comparison with the dental fragments that we had. Most of Marilyn Garland's premolars had fillings. So the fact that all of the fragments also had fillings was consistent with her dental records. So I could never really say that it was absolutely this tooth or that tooth, but I could say that she in life had those teeth. And of those, seven of those eight teeth had fillings. And I've got three fragments of those teeth and all of them have fillings. So it's, it's a consistency there. It's a, it's a point that, that seems to support this association. So it's just one bit of evidence. Those bits of evidence added up to create a portrait of a victim that was alarmingly similar to Marilyn Garland. Marilyn Garland, age 35, stood five feet two inches tall and weighed 115 pounds. Obviously they couldn't positively say that it was her but he was able to say that it was a petite female, possibly white female, uh, between the ages of 25 and 35. I mean, it really narrowed it down, which was you know, surprising to me, just to find some remains, charred remains, to be able to look at him and uh, uh, obtain that much information from him. That was surprising. Awaiting trial, Danny King learned that he'd left enough evidence for scientists to come so close to identifying Marilyn Garland. Rattled by the news, he made one more mistake. Danny King confessed a second time, uh, this time to an inmate at Summit County Jail. And the inmate uh, ended up uh, telling us about it. And uh, Danny King even told him where 
he had disposed of the gun. King admitted stashing the gun in a storm sewer behind a restaurant. Detective Todd drove to the location and found it immediately. Police had all they needed. The confessions, the burned barrel, the weapon, and Doug Owsley, who turned a handful of splintered bones into rock-solid evidence. I've been involved in a number of cases where you're searching for a missing person. You know that person in your heart. You know that person's dead. And they may even have good, strong evidence as to who's behind this. But without that body being recovered and without that physical evidence, you still could go to trial, but it gets much more difficult. It gets, uh, it's, you know, you need a lot of good physical evidence. And a skeleton or a body is going to be a critical thing. Danny King was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 21 years to life. Generations of murderers have relied on fire to hide their crimes. But some little detail always lingers for those who know what to look for. In Tennessee, investigators depended on scorched bones to divine not only a dead man's identity, but also the strange circumstances of his death. On January 15, 1981, a house burned to the ground in Kingsport, Tennessee, before the fire department could save it. The owner, James Grizzle, hadn't been seen since the blaze. Nobody gave it a second thought, because Grizzle spent much of his time in Virginia. Then, Detective James Moffat of the Kingsport Police received a call from Grizzle's mother in Virginia. What's his name? She was concerned because she hadn't heard from her son in several days. What is he Moffat smelled trouble. He knew that Grizzle had hired a live-in handyman named Stephen Leon Williams to help renovate the house. Williams was not a model citizen. I knew Stephen Leon Williams, and I was investigating him on some burglaries. And I knew that uh, Mr. Williams was living with Mr. Grizzle in Hawkins County. I talked to Mr. Grizzle probably about a week before his house burned about Leon. The fire department didn't look for a body once the blaze was out. But after hearing from Grizzle's mother, Moffat began to suspect something more than a house fire. If Grizzle was in the house when it burned, his remains would still be there. Moffat would need an expert to determine if Grizzle's death was an accident or murder. He called state forensic anthropologist William Bass. It's an interesting case because most houses that have burned down, the fire department's been there, lots of people have walked through the area. This was one of the few cases in which nobody had walked into this house at all. So you got there and the house had burned down, and there were no footprints in the house at all. And so we were the first ones in there. See over here. The undisturbed condition of the site assured Bass that any signs of foul play would still be there. Mr. Grizzle may be in there. Moffat pointed out the locations of the bedrooms, kitchen, and living room so Bass could get his bearings. As with any archaeological excavation, he and his team carefully sifted through the debris with trowels and brushes. They moved one brick at a time searching for the all-important remains. A little over an hour after they began, Bass found some human lower leg bones on the concrete basement floor. Before long, scattered bones started coming out of the rubble, and with them, a horrible story began to emerge. The body had been lying on its back, but the legs were up over the body as, as if you lay down and take your feet and pull them up to your head. However, there was no head. The victim was separated below the shoulders and the upper and lower halves of the skeleton were 12 feet apart. That wasn't That's entirely unusual. A skeleton may become jumbled if the victim had fallen through the floor and landed in the basement. But Bass knew that wasn't the case here. Had the body fallen, he would have found debris between the skeleton and the concrete. Bass found no debris. In fact, the victim was fused to the floor. 
It's like taking a piece of meat and putting it in a, in a hot skillet. That meat will sear onto the hot surface. In this case, uh, the fats running out were so hot that they literally solidified the what clothing remained. So we had to scrape off the clothing and there was no debris between the floor and the bones. The condition of the clothing told Bass the victim was in the basement when the fire began. If the body didn't fall from a height, Bass knew of only one other way to explain how the bones became scattered, an explosion. Neighbors' reports confirmed Bass's conclusion. They heard a blast shortly before the fire. Judging from the way the upper torso was separated, Bass suspected the center of the explosion was on the victim's chest. It might have been some freak accident. But then Bass found another clue. The flattened remains of a spent bullet lay upon the basement floor, just below the victim's heart. Bass could tell from its mushroom shape that it had traveled through the victim and flattened against the concrete. At first glance, it looked like homicide. But homicide cases are won on hard facts, not speculation. To prove murder, he needed all the evidence he could muster. In his lab at the University of Tennessee, Bass has teased the truth from countless human remains. Here, he took a closer look at the bones pulled from Grizzle's house. He would try to determine what events caused the destruction of a home and the death of a person. With burned remains, it's not always easy. When a body burns, much of it is destroyed. The arms and legs separate. Fluid in the head turns to steam and bursts the skull. As bones burn, they retain their shape, but they shrink up to 33%, depending on the temperature of the fire, how long they were exposed to it, and which bones they are. Fire turns them brittle. They shatter while they burn and can crumble if they're touched or moved afterward. Collecting a complete skeleton is nearly impossible. Because burning disfigures bones, it's a common way to hide the cause of death. Investigators must learn to distinguish the subtle differences between damage caused by fire and damage from a murder weapon. Bass demonstrates that even a bullet in the head can go undetected unless the forensic investigator knows how to find it. All of these pieces were all together in a jumble. We x-rayed this and there is little flakes of lead in the bone indicating, hey, this individual's been shot. Then we wanted, can we determine where this individual was shot? So we sat down and parted, started putting the skull together, all of these pieces, and sure enough, here comes your entry wound right there. Joanne Bennett, a student of Dr. Bass, is hoping to find a more efficient way to recognize injuries not caused by fire. In her research, she experiments with bone scraps from pigs. First, she damages them to simulate foul play, then burns them to see how they change. We designed several uh, different traumatic events to address, uh, to address the trauma that anthropologists recognize. Bennett and other graduate students saw, strike, and stab a variety of pig bones. The bones are then photographed, x-rayed, and sketched to record every nuance of the damage. Once the bones have been catalogued, the students burn them. If they're lucky, they use a house schedule to be torched for fire training. The goal is to simulate as closely as possible a real-world situation. After the smoke clears, the students pick through the rubble to retrieve as many bone fragments yeah. as they can find. Oh, I found one. They take the bones back to the lab and examine them to see if they can detect the marks they made. 
The marks made by a scalpel or saw blade survived the fire with no problem. The fine striations of the saw can even be seen with the naked eye. The marks made by the hammer are less easy to discern. Bennett is just starting her research. As she and her colleagues experiment with a wider sample of bones, she feels confident they'll come up with some guidelines forensic investigators can use in the future. With the remains in his lab, Bass pieced together the sorry events that transpired in James Grizzle's house. The flattened bullet and scattered bones suggested murder. The color of the bones backed that up. As bones heat up, their color changes. Forensic investigators depend on that to estimate the fire's temperature. Especially hot flames suggest an accelerant like gasoline was used. And that means arson. At about 545 degrees Fahrenheit, bones turn reddish or grayish brown. Between 970 and 1200 degrees, they turn black. Over 1200 degrees, all the organic material burns out, leaving a white shell of calcium. The remains in Grizzle's house were white. They must have burned at about 2000 degrees, indicating the use of an accelerant. Bass concluded the fire was deliberately set. Now, Bass was sure he could prove homicide. The burned remains told him that the victim was shot to death, the body blown apart, and the house set on fire to hide the crime. But who was the victim? Though reasonably certain it was James Grizzle, Bass had to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Without naming the victim, Moffat couldn't catch his murderer. To identify the victim, Bass first examined seams in the skull, called sutures. They slowly close as we grow older and are gone by age 40. Inside the skull of the victim, the sutures had disappeared. On the outside, they were almost completely gone as well. Now this would indicate that he was not only 18, but was, you know, middle-aged. You get in at least 30s, so, so forth. Age can be determined another way, by looking at the joint surfaces of the bones. As people age, the body deposits more bone around the joints, causing a condition called arthritic lipping. It begins in the late 20s or early 30s and increases with age. The lipping was consistent with someone in his mid-30s. James Grizzle was 38 years old. Bass next examined the external occipital protuberance, the bulge on the back of the head, to determine the victim's sex. The structure is larger in males than in females. It left Bass with little room for doubt that the victim was male. This is one of the best ones I've ever seen. This is a classic textbook case of an external occipital protuberance which would indicate that this individual was, was a male. So by just this little piece you could get not only sex but age with, with that right there. Um, this From is the, the evidence, the right Bass piece. determined the victim was a white male in his mid-30s, a description consistent with James Grizzle, but not close enough to hold up in court. To be absolutely positive, Bass relied on Grizzle's dental records. You have this tooth with a filling that's attached to the tooth after the fire. So we asked the police if they could find from the family a dental record of him. We knew he'd been to the dentist because you could see there were fillings in here. Bass compared the structure of the tooth and the shape of the root. From Grizzle's dental records, he was able to make his final determination. This was the skeleton of James Grizzle. The teeth provided Bass with a quick and easy way to make a difficult identification. But it was important that he first tried to make the ID using the bones. Otherwise, he'd have no way of knowing if more than one victim was buried in the rubble. If the bones and teeth all suggest the same person, Bass can be confident only one victim was buried there. That person was James Grizzle. Based on this information, 
Detective Moffat had a case against Leon Williams. It was further bolstered by the discovery that Williams had stolen James Grizzle's truck and forged his checks. Faced with the evidence, Leon Williams confessed. In his confession, he confirmed Bass's careful reconstruction of the crime. He shot James Grizzle in the basement, poured gasoline throughout the house, strapped an explosive to the victim, and when it went off, it set the house on fire. For his crime, Leon Williams was sentenced to life. If you don't destroy the evidence, if you don't you know, bring in a bulldozer and clean it all off or something like that, the evidence is there. If you know what to look for, it takes you a while, but uh, we were able to reconstruct the events that occurred in this case exactly the way the individual who was charged and, and convicted said it happened. William Bass unmasked a killer who went to great lengths to disguise his crime. Elsewhere, a man went to greater lengths to bring the bones of his missing brother back from Guatemala. Guatemala, 1985. A country caught in a civil war between the government and communist guerrillas. In the outlying villages, the government appoints civil patrollers, an armed militia made up of civilians. Everyone must serve one day a week. The government provides guns, but no training. It instructs the militia to patrol for communist rebels, but nobody patrols the militia. For hungry young journalists, 1985 was an exciting and dangerous time to be in Guatemala. Freelance American journalist Nick Blake and photographer Griffith Davis underestimated that danger. In their pursuit of a story, they headed into a remote part of the country and vanished. Nick Blake's brother, Randy, did all he could to uncover what happened. My brother disappeared in March of 85. I'd been doing requests with the State Department and four or five other federal agencies uh, who would be in a position to know things, such as the CIA and the National Security Agency and others uh, for ever since, you know, probably 1987. Randy Blake found only dead ends. Then, a year and a half into his search, he heard an unconfirmed story from an American teacher in a village in Guatemala. We would go to little fiestas with him and so forth, and he got to know them, and they would talk about the gringos that got killed by the Civil Patrol. Piecing together the details, the teacher believed the Civil Patrol shot the journalists in 1985. A ravine became their makeshift grave. The Blake family kept pressure on the U.S. and Guatemalan governments to find Nick. To hide the crime, the Civil Patrol retrieved the skeletons and burned them in a raging bonfire. The flames split and shattered the bones beyond all recognition. Or at least that's what the patrollers thought. But the Blake family persisted. The patrollers were pressured into sending the remains to the United States. They arrived in 1990, but an analysis uncovered a deception. The crate did not contain human remains. Convinced they had exposed a cover-up, the Blakes and U.S. authorities demanded the truth. Felipe Alva, the regional commander of the Guatemalan Civil Patrol, refused to talk about the incident until the Blakes offered an incentive. And he was going to be offered a $10,000 reward. And so, but it was going to be paid to him in allotments as he performed along the job. Enticed by the offer, Alva agreed to send the real remains to the U.S. so long as the family promised not to prosecute. He came out with a partial unearthing of remains from the site. 
and he brought them back in two boxes, very curious things. They were essentially little caskets, mini caskets, square pine boxes that were velvet lined. And it was the strangest thing because they had dirt in them from the site with little bone chips salted throughout them and so forth, because that's essentially what was remained in my brother and his friend. The grim homecoming occurred without ceremony at a loading dock behind the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. The unmarked remains had traveled over 3,000 miles to get there. Navigating through a maze of deception and lies. But more work lay ahead before the Blakes could put their loved one to rest and find the closure they sought. This time, they had to be certain the bones in the crates were truly Nick's and Griffith's. For the delicate task of identifying the remains, they pinned their hopes on forensic anthropologist Doug Owsley. When the crates arrived, they were x-rayed to see if they required special handling to avoid damage. They contained no surprises. Mostly soil, ash, roots, and bits of bone. Then, Owsley and his team sorted the bones. It was immediately apparent the remains were human. They also found a duplication of parts and a color difference. Owsley was certain these were the remains of two people. Out of 150 pounds of dirt and debris, they recovered about two pounds of incinerated bone. The largest of the more than 1,600 fragments was just three inches long. But Owsley was fortunate. Some of the fragments came from the occipital protuberance at the back of the skull. The large size of the specimens indicated both were male. But they could have been almost any two men. Then he found a nickel-sized piece of bone that made all the difference. It was a fragment that fits in the forehead and forms a ridge or crest for the sinuses inside the skull. It's called the frontal crest. Now this is a really unusual configuration of the frontal crest here. Usually this is a, a solid, prominent ridge, but in a small percentage of the population you can get a double ridge morphology like that. So we had this piece, and based on that, I had a, a microfilm of an X-ray that was taken of Griffith Davis. Owsley compared the crest with an X-ray of Davis's head taken after a car accident. The unusual structure of the bone fragment from Guatemala matched the X-ray. But did that prove the fragment came from Davis's skull? Not unless Owsley could first prove that its structure was truly rare. To see how often the crest structure occurred in the general population, Owsley referred to a group of skeletons known as the Terry Collection. The more than 1,600 skeletons of the Terry Collection were donated for medical research from the 1920s to the 1940s. They represent a cross-section of the population. The medical history of each individual is part of the record. Owsley used the Terry Collection to see what percentage of the population shared Davis's frontal crest structure. If only a few people had that bone configuration, and if it was shared by the Guatemala sample and Davis, then Owsley could reasonably conclude the bones could belong to Davis. If you look at this cranial vault, for instance, one of the things that you've got is here's a cribriform plate, frame and cecum, and then you've got this standard type of frontal crest. And it's a very prominent ridge that occurs in 88% of white males. Now, in contrast, you see how you've got, again, the same structure, but now we've got a double ridge and a groove. This is the type that we see in, in, in Griffith Davis's cranium. This occurs 9% of the time. Davis and the remains from Guatemala shared the same rare anatomical feature. Owsley felt confident the skull fragments could belong to Davis. But were the remaining bones Nick Blake's?
The limited sample enabled Owsley to perform only one more test, determining the relative age of the bodies. For this, he relied on the sutures in the skulls. In the specimen that Owsley thought to be Griffith Davis, the sutures showed advanced closure, suggesting a man in his 30s. The sutures on the other remains were still open, indicating a younger man. So that helped differentiate. The two, two males were differing in age by about 11 years. And this helped me determine that this is the older person. At the time of his death, Griffith Davis was 38. Nick Blake was 27. Owsley's calculation was right on the mark. To Randy Blake, Owsley's identification was encouraging, but naggingly inconclusive. If these bones were truly the remains of his brother, he needed to be absolutely sure. As long as a shadow of doubt persisted, the Blakes could not give up their search. But Owsley had reached his limit. He could go no further without more remains. We said to ourselves, you know, I mean, it's probably Nick, but you know, darn it, we want to get up to that site and we want to determine definitely that this is Nick and let's, 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 let's just make a trip down there. We've got an opportunity. Going to Guatemala was the only choice the Blakes had if they wanted to honor their brother. But Owsley had to accompany them. Only he could provide the assurance the Blakes had waited so long for. Together, they would retrace the final steps of Nicholas Blake and Griffith Davis. With forensic anthropologist Doug Owsley's help, Randy Blake felt he was close to finding his brother. He knew that the only way to claim Nick's remains was to retrieve them himself. Randy, his brother Sam, Owsley, and a colleague made the trip to Guatemala in June 1992. There, they met regional civil patrol commander Felipe Alva. He took them to the remote mountain location of the remains. But Owsley wasn't buying it. And I take my trowel and uh, do a little scraping. I cut down to about 15 centimeters, and I, I come up and say, this is the wrong site. I say, there's not enough ash. There's no bone fragments here. There's, there's uh, none of the red soil that I'm looking for. There, I just looked at this, all of this, two containers uh, a couple months before, and, and there's no, uh, no the, none of the roots that were found in any of that. Then, sheepishly, Alva's assistant reached under a log and removed a green plastic bag that contained a handful of human bone fragments and some soil. And in this eight ounces of soil, it's got the right color, it's got the charcoal, it's got root fragments. And I say, this is from the right site. And he says, I got it right here. The assistant told them these were the last of the remains. The Americans demanded to see where they came from. We went back to our little hotel in, in Nebab and we, we basically grilled, I mean, grilled Felipe Alva for three hours that night with a Guatemalan colonel, U.S. Embassy defense attache, U.S. Army colonel couple of other people in the room and basically said and that said Alva you lied to us under duress Felipe Alva agreed to take the team to a site he swore was the actual location of the remains when they arrived two days later Owsley looked it over with a skeptic's eye we could see the indentation where the soil had been taken out we worked it around the perimeters and we found a lot of things one of the things we found lots of was metal well here's part of an eyeglass frame part of the eyeglass piece and the frame, and it's a circular, circular type of pattern. And it's one of the things that when we first picked it up, one of the brothers of this man said, that looks like his glasses. So we knew that we were in a very significant spot. Now certain they had the right spot, the team collected all they could and headed home. It was almost like tailor-made for Doug Owsley. I mean, it was like it was so, it was so perfect because he, he, you know, we were so lucky to have him in that one day because clearly a deception was, was planned and was about was being executed, clearly. And, and, and he, he just totally blew it out of the water by, by being there and allowed us to have the ammunition to get this guy to come clean. Among the bones Doug Owsley carried back with him were fragments of a shattered jawbone. 
they still held some of the teeth and all the roots. They would enable him to make a direct comparison to Blake's dental records. From the dental records that we had of him in life, we knew that he had impacted third molars. And they had come in at an angle where the third molar had bumped into the second and had gotten locked up. And so what it had actually done is wore a contact or a wear facet into the side of the second molar. And it had a very distinctive root associated with it. From the shape of the teeth and roots, Owsley was able to positively identify Nick Blake. For the Blake family, it marked the end of a grueling emotional ordeal. Now they could grieve Nick's loss and give his remains a proper burial. That meant everything to repatriate his remains and bring them back and, and, and bury them in a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a cemetery and give them a grave marker, which we did. Not enough remains of Blake or Davis were recovered to confirm they were shot. For the Blakes and the Davises, that was no longer important. Bringing Nick and Griffith home was enough. From the ashes of murder rise lingering clues, transformed but never erased. As scientists learn to read their meaning, they can restore what the fire has taken. And by doing so, find a loved one or catch a killer. Yeah.